What's up, everybody? Welcome to DFS by the Numbers. These are my full card breakdown and predictions for UFC Vegas 28. We have Jarzina Rosenstruck going against Augusta Sakai, a card that, you know, maybe the main event's not the best, but I, we have 14 fights. It's a great opportunity to make some money. I think there's a lot of great spots, and we have some fights. We didn't have fights last week. It sucked. It sucks always when there's no fights, but, you know, luckily we're back and, uh, yeah, ready to go. So a few things I want to point out before we get started. Um, the first thing is it's going to be a longer video. We have 14 fights. I'll try to keep it um, as dense as possible here. Try to keep it around an hour or so, but there will be timestamps in the description below. And I do want to point out that it's a fantastic time to sign up for the Patreon at the beginning of the month here. I do want to pull up the betting package, which is going to be the most popular option. Um, it's $10 a month, or you can save 10% if you do sign up for the year. Um, with that, you get access to the UFC statistical model, which I'll show you guys in a second. First notice on all the bets, betting article, betting breakdown videos, Hail Mary Parley, and access to Discord. Tons and tons of content. Um, you know, basically $2.50 per week. You can't get much better than that. And I do also want to show you guys kind of the new stats thing that I did um, bring in. Shout out to Uncle Weezy. He does the, the stat model here. And he just has so much information here. I mean, you can take a look. And I saw his actual database, and it's just something like I've never seen before. But he puts it all in here. It's called the Ad Advanced Stats tab. You'd have basically every single fighter and um, basically any single stat you could ever look for. And then he also did something um, brand new. This is brand new. I think we implemented it last month, which is going to be the matchup template. So we take all these stats, or he takes all the stats, and he puts them side by side. You take a look at the tail of the tape, the experience, UFC experience, pro experience, the finish stats, grappling stats, striking stats, um, wins, losses, all that good stuff. And he has it for every single matchup. I mean, the amount of effort this guy puts in is just phenomenal. So um, if you think my, my bets suck, if you think everything sucks, all that, um, this is well worth the $10 in its, in its own right, but um, I do think that there is a ton of content, especially for the $10 price tag there. So if nothing else, if you do want to support me more, this is a great way to do it. I'll never ask for tips or donations or nothing like that, but if it really, really does help me out, it helps me do new things, helps me bring new things to the channel. I um, brought in a brand new MMA optimizer for the DFS um, part of it um, two months ago as well, so it lets me do stuff like that. So with all that out of the way, I'm back. There I am. Um, I do want to let you guys know about the live stream on Friday, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, and then the live stream on Saturday, which is going to be one hour prior to when the prelims start, which I'm not sure when it starts, but as always, one hour prior to that. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Okay, um, yeah, that's about it. So if before we get started, if you guys can leave a like on the video, one small like goes a long way, really does help out. Also, hit the subscribe button if you can. About 80 subs away from uh, 11K, so maybe get that by the end of the week. That'd be sweet. But, uh, yeah, so we'll get to it. Like I said, I'll try to keep this as, as dense as possible. There's some matchups I really want to talk about, and there's some matchups I really you really don't want to talk about, to be honest. Um, so we'll keep it. try to keep it around an hour for you guys. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I have five bets already. Uh, if you want to check them out early, the Patreon is in the link below. If not, talk about them on Friday. I'm sure I'll be adding stuff throughout the week as well. So we'll get started here. Okay, um, yeah. First of all, we have the uh, Jordan Levitt versus Claudio Puelas fight, and this is a fight that I am least looking forward to. I have struggled so much uh, with this fight throughout the week. I've done, you know, so much tape on it. I've watched pretty much the whole career of Puelas. I've watched the whole career of Levitt as much fights as I could. There's only, like, maybe four fights out there on him, and I'm just really, really struggling with this matchup. I mean, this matchup is just so tough to call here. We have Levitt, who is 25 years old, 5'9". 71 inch reach, 8 and 0, and 5 and 0 in his last five fights. Claudio Puelas, 25 years old, 5 foot 11, 72 inch reach, 9 and 2, and 4 and 1 in his last five fights. So we'll take a look at the odds. And I kind of talked about this on my first look video I did last week, and I thought the line was off, and I do stand by that. But we have Jordan Levitt open up minus 240, which is insane. Currently minus 225, which is insane as well. Claudio Puelas is plus 185, open up plus 180. And, you know, people are really high on Jordan Levitt, especially after the finish of Matt Wyman. It was a phenomenal finish, but we got to remember that Matt Wyman is, you know, just about 40 years old. He is way towards the end of his career, and, and yes, he did pick him up and slam him. That was Levitt's first knockout win, but, I mean, that just does not impress me. And you take a look at Claudio Puelas, and, uh, man, the guy's not great. He's not great. He's not great, but I will say this. He's 25 years old. Some of these losses that he was having, um, people bring up these losses when he was like 20, 21. So you've got to think that he is making improvements. I believe he's training at Sanford MMA as well, which I do think that's going to help quite a bit. But, man, he, yeah, he's not great. 
Um, I think this is a, a grappler versus grappler. Both guys, their striking is, is pretty bad. If I had to give an advantage to one guy, I, I guess it's play loss because at least he's shown me a little something. Levitt showed me nothing. And as far as picking a winner, I just, I, don't, I honestly don't know. Like, this fight can go either way. So I don't get this line. But I will say, you know, Levitt, he's, he's very unorthodox. His striking's, you know, not great at all. Um, his takedown attempts are, are just not set up great at all. He really does not set anything up. I've seen him do the, you know, the butt scoots where he can't get a takedown and he's like scooting towards his opponent. But I will say this, when Levitt does get on top, when Levitt does get on the mat, he looks really good. He looks really good. And on paper, um, Poilos is probably a better grappler on paper. He's a brown belt compared to Levitt as a purple belt. But I think that, you know, as far as, you know, skill on the mat goes, I, I guess I do got to favor Levitt in that aspect. But man, am I not laying minus 225. I am not laying minus 225. I hate this fight. I hate it. But ultimately, I will side with Jordan Levitt to win by decision. I'd be kind of shocked if either guy subbed either guy. Um, but yeah, I'm going to take Jordan Levitt to win by decision. I don't really like this fight at all, but I will take him to win. Um, get the better of the grappling exchanges. Like I said, on paper, you know, play loss is the better grappler. And maybe, he, maybe he is. Maybe those two years, maybe he's made improvements. But as far as I am concerned, I, I do think Levitt's better on the mat. So give me Levitt by decision, but I will have zero action on this fight. All right, uses allow going against Sean Woodson, a fight that I'm looking forward to. Here we have Sean Woodson, who is 20 years old, six foot two. 79 inch reach, 7 and 1 and 4 and 1 in his last five fights. Uses allow. He is 24 years old, 5 foot 10, 75 inch reach, 10 and 4 and 3 and 2 in his last five fights. So, yeah, Woodson's going to have a 4 inch height advantage and a 4 inch reach advantage as well. And he, you know, pretty much anybody he faces, he's going to have a, a big reach advantage in this division. So, we'll take a look at the odds here. And we have. Uh, Sean Woodson opened up minus 260, which is crazy, currently minus 190, and Eustace Allow opened up plus 200, currently plus 165, another line that I really do think is off. I think this fight should be, honestly, probably a pick, and you take a look at Eustace Allow, and yes, he's going to be at a, a reach disadvantage, he's probably going to be at a striking disadvantage, but I think an interesting aspect of this fight is going to be the ground game of Eustace Allow. You see, you take a look against Austin Lingo, which this surprised me. This surprised me. I was not expecting him to go out there, but he took Austin Lingo down six times. Um, he took down a slippery Pete Barrett three times as well. He took down Sung Vu Choi three times. So he's more than capable of going out there and getting takedowns. Does average about two and a half per 15 minutes, 40% accuracy. And Sean Woodson on paper, he does have a very good takedown defense, 77%. But that was because he stuffed like, what, 13? No, 15. He stuffed 15 takedowns against uh, Kyle Bokniak. Who's not the you know the best wrestler at all? But Julian Arosa was able to get him down three times. Um, you know Terrence McKinney was able to get him down two times. And McKinney in that fight, he had a lot of success. He had a lot of success in that fight. He was able to control him for like a good five six minutes on the mat. Um, you know, get in some pretty dominant positions as well. And then yeah, Woodson knocked him out with a flying knee. But still, McKinney did have quite a bit of success um, until he got finished there. So. On the feet, I actually think it's you know kind of close. You gotta favor Woodson. You gotta favor the reach. You gotta favor the boxing. But I think an interesting aspect of this fight is uh, Zalal getting it down to the mat, and I think he could. And I do think he can have some success on the mat as well. He's a brown belt in BJJ. Just got his brown belt, and I, I don't know. I just don't get this line. So I'm gonna take Zalal to win. I think if he comes in here with the you know a game plan of you know, not going for takedowns, yeah, he's going to lose. But if he does come in here with the game plan of, you know, going for takedowns, you know, getting this fight down to the mat, mixing him in, I think is a very, very good chance to, to win this fight. So I'm going to take Zalao. I'm going to take him to win by decisions. Zalao's not a finisher at all, at least in the UFC. Um, but I really do think he can win this fight. I'm going to take Zalao to win by decision. All right, interesting fight here as well. We have Manon Fioro. Going against Marina Rose, we have Fiora, who is 31 years old. She is 5'7", 66-inch reach, 6-1, and 5-0 and um, in her last five fights. And then Marina Rose, she is 29 years old, 5'7", 67-inch reach, 10-3, and 3-2 and and in her last five fights. And I'm really looking forward to this fight. We have the odds here. Fiora opened up minus 195, currently minus 160. Morose opened up plus 160, currently plus 140. So Fiora did open up as a bigger favorite. She has closed down. I do understand that. To an extent, I do think she should not be around the minus 200. Maybe around the minus 160 is, is definitely fair there. But, man, you take a look at Amanda Fiora. The, the problem I have with her is going to be the level of competition. 
The level of competition is not great at all. But really, I mean, that's the only problem I have with her. I think she's a phenomenal striker. I think she hits very, very hard. I think she has a lot of volume. Um, I think, you know, she's really defensively sound. Um, and I, the only problem I have is the level of competition. It, it's not her fault. It's not her fault she hasn't fought anybody good. But this is going to be a, a big step up for sure. And I do think this is a, a test that she can pass. They're going against Marina Moroz where you take a look at her um, – She's high volume. She lands 4.09 significant strikes per minute, but she does absorb 4.15, so she does have that significant strike differential that is negative, which I don't like to see. And a 53% striking defense, which I really don't like to see, especially in this matchup. She is pretty hittable, but she is tough. She does have a chin to back it up, but you know you don't want to be hittable against Mana Fioro here. And then kind of the, the grappling takedown stats here, and I think this is a big aspect of the fight as well because if Rose can get this down to the mat, I think she can have some success. It's just... I find it hard to see Moreau's A, taking Fioro down, and B, holding Fioro down as well. So there was a pro, her pro MMA debut of Fioro, where she was taken down a couple times by Leah McCourt, who is now, I believe, a 145er. Um, that fight was at a 138-pound catch weight, and it was her MMA pro debut. So you've got to cut her a little bit of slack there. Um, it wasn't at the correct weight class. Um, you know, Fioro's a 125er. Of course, a 145er, um, but I, you have seen improvements. You have seen improvements since that fight, and she is making a ton of them um, each and every fight. She's able to stuff takedowns. She does get taken down. She's really, really hard to hold down. And then you take a look at Rose, who does average about a half a takedown for 50 minutes. And, you know, first look, I thought, man, I thought she'd got a lot more takedowns than that. But no, half a takedown for 50 minutes, only an 18% takedown accuracy and a 47% takedown defense herself. And what really opened my eyes was, man, Yes, she beat uh, Sabina Mazo, who I, I think is extremely overrated, to be honest. She held her down for, you know, seven minutes, which everybody holds down Mazo if they do get her down. But she was one for nine on takedowns against Sabina Mazo, which, you know, not a great look to me. And then she was like two for ten on takedowns against Mara Buena Silva, which not terrible. But still, I don't think Rose has the wrestling to get Fiora down or even hold her down. Fiora is very strong, very good takedown defense and a very good get-up game. And I do think this does play out on the feet. And with that said, I do think Fioro is the better striker. It's not like a significant advantage to Fioro. I think there's a a, 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 a a slight advantage to Fioro. But I think the power, you know, the volume, landing the much, 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 much harder shots. And I think that Fioro is more defensively sound, unlike Rose, who is very hittable in my opinion. So I'm going to take Fioro. I think a finish is likely, but I will say by decision. And this is a, a big test for her. Biggest test of her career. And I do think she passes it. And I do think, you know, she moves up those rankings a little bit. So give me Fioro by decision. All right, we have Mason Jones going against Alon Patrick. We have Mason Jones is 26 years old, 5'10", 72-inch reach, 10-1, and 4-1 and and in the last five fights. Alon Patrick is 37 years old, 5'11", 74-inch reach, 15-3, and 3-2 and and in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds. And I believe Mason Jones is the biggest favorite on the card. Opening at minus 290, currently minus 300. Patrick open at plus 230, currently plus 250. And uh, yeah, I think the line's you know more than justified here, and we'll kind of talk about why. And we take a look at Mason Jones. Um, he came into the UFC as a 10-0 undefeated fighter. Went against Mike Davis, who I am extremely, extremely high on Mike Davis. And I believe I did pick Mike Davis, if I'm not mistaken, in that fight. But, man, that was such a, a close, close fight there in a, in a fight that Mason Jones actually outlanded Mike Davis 117 to 108 in the total strikes. And man, if you have not seen that fight, go back and watch it. That fight was probably one of the best fights um, of the year. But uh, man, Mason Jones, um, he's just really well-rounded. He has a great ground game, black belt in BJJ. His striking's phenomenal. We saw how great his striking is. Maybe the striking defense needs some improvement, but hey, he doesn't have to worry about that here against Alain Patrick, who does average less than two significant strikes per minute. And you know, the thing with Alain Patrick, um, He's getting up there in age. He's 37 years old. He's about to be 38. He hasn't looked great. He has not looked great since, like, 2018, Demir Hadzovic, where he took him down nine times, had, like, 13 minutes of control time. But, again, that's Demir Hadzovic, who does not have a ground game. Um, and then against Scott Holzman, he just did not look great. Um, that was 2018. Holzman was able to stuff all those takedowns, ended up finishing Alain Patrick. And then against Bobby Green in 2020, he did not look great at all. He was able to get down Bobby Green once, but it was Bobby Green who was actually going out there and taking down Alain Patrick. And yeah, Patrick has a 50% takedown defense. I think if Mason Jones wants to, which I don't know why he would want to here, but if he wanted to, he could probably take down Patrick here. But 
it's simple as this like Mason Jones is going to win the striking exchanges by a, a mile I mean the striking is not even close Patrick nowadays he's getting wobbled by every single shot that lands green wobbled him a couple times um, Holtzman wobbled him a couple times finished him um, I think Mason Jones is very live for a finish here Mason Jones, his takedown defense, he did get taken down by Davis. Davis was not able to do anything with those takedowns, and that, that's kind of how it is. I mean, his takedown defense is is solid. He can be taken down, but he's very, very hard to hold down as well. And like I said, any, any exchange on the feet is going to be massively favored for Jones, and I think I'd be shocked if Mason Jones honestly did not knock out Alain Patrick here. But uh, yeah, I'll take Jones here. I'm going to take Jones by knockout. Biggest favorite on the card for a reason. I do like him here to win by knockout. I think Patrick, the chin's not there. The striking is 100% not there. The striking defense is 100% not there. And I do think Jones does finish him. If you could take a look at some of the shots that Mike Davis was eating, I, I really find it hard to believe that Alon Patrick does eat those same shots. So give me Mason Jones and give me Mason Jones by knockout. All right, um, Muslim Salikov going against Francisco Trinaldo. We have Salikov, he's 36 years old, 5'11", 69 and a half inch reach, 17 and 2 and 4 and 1 in his last five fights. Francisco Trinaldo, 42 years old, 5'9", 70 inch reach, 26 and 7 and 4 and 1 in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. We have Salikov opening up minus 250, currently minus 255. And then Francisco Trinaldo opened up plus 190, currently plus 215. And, yeah, really interesting fight. I mean, some things you got to point out right away is going to be the age of Trinaldo. I mean, 42 years old, about to be 43 in, in what, August? That's insane. And you take a look at his last fight against uh, Jai Herbert where, man, I thought Herbert really had it in the bag. Trinaldo gassed out bad, I believe, in that second round, um, early second round, and then he was gassed out and went into the third round, and then, uh, you know, Trinaldo clipped Herbert in the third round, I remember the live line on that fight. It was like minus 1,000 in favor of Herbert. It was crazy. And then Tornado ended up clipping and, and knocking out Herbert, which was insane. It was a brutal, brutal knockout. But um, I don't know. I don't know. This fight is, is weird. This fight is probably honestly like the worst fight on the card just because of how low volume both guys are. Salakov does average about 2.85 significant strikes per minute. Tornado 3.11. So, so low volume. This has the potential to be a very boring fight. And I don't know, I don't really see a finish. And, and uh, Trinado, he has like, what, 34 fights, 33 fights. The dude has a chin. The dude has never, ever been finished. Could Salakab be the first guy to do so? Maybe. But I do think this fight goes to decision. I think it's low volume. I do think the flashier, the better looking strikes are going to be coming from Salakab. I do think probably a little bit more volume as well. Trinado, I guess he could try to work that ground game. We have seen Salakab struggle with the ground game. I believe both of Salikov's losses have been by submission. So if Toronto wants to go there, it just if he does not have success, he could, you know, really, really gas out, especially at 43 years old. He can gas out. And I think Salikov could maybe get a late finish as well. But yeah, Salikov has struggled with that ground game. But we do see improvements from Salikov. Um, I know people always like to pick against him because of some fights that happened, you know, years ago. I mean, how three years, six three years, five months ago against Alex Garcia. Garcia was able to take him down a couple times, ended up um, submitting him fairly easy in that fight as well. But I do think he has made improvements, and I don't think Trinado really has the cardio to implement that ground game. So I'm going to take uh, Salikov to win a boring decision. The more flashier, the better looking strikes. I'd be shocked if there was a finish, but if there is a finish, it's probably in that third round. But I'll take Salikov by decision. All right, we have a heavyweight fight here. Tanner Bozer going against Alir Latifi. We have Bozer, who's 29 years old, 6'2", 75 and a half inch reach, 19, 7, and 1. And 3-2 and two in his last five fights. Alir Latifi, he's 37 years old, 5'10", 75-inch reach, 14-8, and 2-3 and and in his last five fights. So, yeah, we'll take a look at the odds here. And we have Bozer, who opened up minus 255. My goodness, currently minus 190. Latifi opened up plus 195, currently plus 165. So, some money's coming in on Latifi, and, and, and probably rightfully so. I think this fight should be aligned a little bit closer because there are some question marks that we'll talk about. So for Latifi, I mean, this is a, a, a classic case of, uh, you know, we got the striker versus the, the wrestler grappler here in Bozer. Bozer's going to want to keep this on the feet, and Latifi's going to want to get this down to the mat. I, I wouldn't imagine that Latifi wants to, you know, stay at range with Bozer. I mean, that's, you know, the worst thing he can do, but I do think he wants to press him up against the cage and take him down. And on paper, Tanner Bozer has a 100% takedown defense. On paper, he does. 
But the problem with that, the problem with on paper is um, he hasn't fought anybody that's going to take him down. I mean, he's uh, he's defended maybe two takedowns officially, if that. Arlovsky uh, didn't take him down. I think Pessoa, I, I technically tried to take him down once. Um, Philippe Linz didn't try to take him down. Gon technically tried to take him down once. Um, and then Daniel Spitz didn't try to take him down. So his wrestling has not been tested. But you go and look at the tape on the regional scene, and you do see him getting taken down. You do see him getting controlled against the cage. You do see um, him you know, being a fish out of water on the mat. And it's kind of hard to gauge because you know, that was a couple years ago. Could he make these improvements? Possibly, but we just don't know that. So there are some question marks for me. You know, the Latifi gas tank's not a great look. That does scare me quite a bit. But I think Latifi, if he does get this down to the mat, which I, I think he can, uh, I think he can. He was able to have some success, some success with taking down a Derek Lewis in his last fight in a fight that, man, I really thought that Latifi won. And I had a bet on Lewis myself. But, you know, nothing happened in that fight. You can't really call it a robbery or nothing like that. But Latifi did take down Lewis three times. And Latifi did control Lewis for about nine minutes as well. So, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna take a shot on the dog here with Latifi. I don't know if I'm going to bet it yet or not. But I just think the line's off. I think he has a, a path to victory with the takedowns. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I'm not all that impressed with Bozer, especially after his last performance against Andre Arlovsky in a fight that, yeah, I thought he won, but man, he could have, he could have really, you know, did more. He could have did more. He did outland Arlovsky 68 to 34, which is, you know, double the output there, but, um, just wasn't impressed. Wasn't impressed. So I'm going to take Latifi for the win. I think he does mix in the takedowns, get some control time. Um, I've seen Bozer taken down and around and, and not get back up. I've seen him taken down, not get back up for the rest of the round. I can kind of see something like that happening. But I will take Latifi for the decision win. All right, next we have Montana De La Rosa going against Ariana Lipsky, and we will get into some stats for this fight as well. We have Montana De La Rosa, who is 26 years old. She is 5'7", 68-inch reach, 11-6, and 2-2, two and two, or 11-6-1, and 2-2-1 and one. And two and two and one in her last five fights. She had that draw in her last fight. And then Lipsky, 27 years old, five foot six, 67 inch reach, 13 and six, and two and three in her last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. And uh, De La Rosa opened up minus 170, currently minus 255. And then Lipsky opened up plus 140, currently plus 215. So people are watching the tape and saying, yeah, Montana De La Rosa probably should be a, a bigger favorite here than where the line opened. And I, I completely agree. And then we'll take a look at you know some of the stats here that I do want to talk about. So as far as the striking stats go, I think their striking is, is you know pretty similar. Both are you know phenomenal on the feet, but I do probably give a, a slight advantage to Lipsky. But we see Montana De La Rosa making a ton of improvements. We've seen her striking look a lot better than it has in the past, but still probably got to favor Lipsky in that aspect, and that's 100% fine. But I think the important aspect of this fight is going to be the takedown defense. And Lipsky has a 45% takedown defense, which is not great, especially in this matchup going against somebody in De La Rosa who does have a wrestling background and who does have, I believe, a BJJ brown belt, maybe a BJJ black belt. But she's obviously going to be the much better grappler, the much better wrestler. And I do think this fight is won and lost on the mat. And uh, you got to go with De La Rosa here. I'm, I'm pretty confident in De La Rosa here unless she comes out here and completely forgets how to wrestle, uh, which, you know, that's probably not going to be the case. She does go to that game plan quite a bit. And you take a look at Lipsky, and you know something that jumps off the page to me, and, and probably should jump off the page to everybody is, well, Molly McCann, the boxer, did take her down two times. Uh, Molly McCann, the boxer, was able to control her for a little bit, and then what you know really did it for me was in Antonina Shevchenko fight, where she was able to get down Lipsky, and I thought, hey, maybe maybe Lipsky has the advantage on the mat. Maybe Lipsky's you know better on the mat. Shevchenko, you know, she's a striker, but no, Shevchenko dominated Ariana Lipsky. Antonina Shevchenko, the bad Shevchenko, dominated Ariana Lipsky. And what that did was it really overrated Antonina going into the Andrea Lee fight. Andrea, everybody thought that Antonina made massive, massive improvements. And no, there were no improvements. It was just because Lipsky has nothing, has doesn't know what to do on the mat. So um, yeah, I'm going to De La Rosa here. I think there's a good chance for a submission as well. And I'm actually going to take De La Rosa to win by submission. Um, I think she gets her down at will pretty much. And when she does, I just don't think Lipsky has anything to offer on her back. So uh, give me Montana, Montana De La Rosa by submission. De La Rosa has finished, actually, the majority of her fights by submission. 75% finish rate, and the, all those are by submission. So she's finishing every three out of her four wins by submission. I think another one does come here as well. 
And yeah, it, it did look like she was about to be the biggest favorite on the card, which is crazy. I know people really, you know, don't like De La Rosa. They, th they think she sucks and all that. People really like Lipsky. Um, you take a look at the Tapology pr uh, predictions, and it's like 70% Lipsky for some reason. But I don't know. It, it's uh, it's a really good matchup for De La Rosa here. So give me De La Rosa to win, and I'm going to take her to win by sub. All right. Makwan Amarakani going against Camilla Kirk. We have Amarakani, 32 years old, 5'10", 72-inch reach, 16-5, and, and, and 3-2 and in his last five fights, Camilla Kirk. 27 years old, 5 foot 10, 75 inch reach, 11 and 4 and 3 and 2 in his last five fights. Taking a look at the odds here, we have a Mac Juan and Marconi open at minus 305, currently minus 275. Camilla Kirk open at plus 225, currently plus 215. The line's coming in a little bit, and as it should, I just don't, don't really don't understand why this line is so wide. I mean, these fighters are are both very similar. I believe Kirk is a black belt, as we know that uh, you know Mac Juan's a black belt as well. It's just one of those cases where. They have a very similar skill set. I just think that Mac Juan is better in every single area, um, especially in the grappling. I think he's the much, 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 much better grappler. I think he's the better wrestler. I think he's you know probably the better striker as well. And then also the level of competition Mac Juan's fought has been you know much, much, much better as well. So for all those reasons, you got to favor Mac Juan. Maybe not you know minus three hundred Mac Juan, but you do got to favor him a little bit. Um, I do remember Kirk from the Contender Series against Billy Quarantillo, where he looked really good. He looked really good early on. He took down Billy Quarantillo early in the fight. He had a really good first round. But after that, you know, he, he gassed out a little bit. And that's another concern for me as well is going to be the short notice of Camelo Kerr coming in here on about a week and a half to two weeks notice. Just not a good look, um, you know, after he did gas out um, in that Billy Quarantillo fight bad. And Billy Quarantillo put an absolute beating on him in that second round. I remember he landed like, like all, just about 120 strikes on Kirk as well. So um, the short notice... I think Mac Juan's better, you know, pretty much everywhere. Mac Juan Marikani, his gas tank's not, you know, the best himself, but um, I do think, you know, he, he does get takedowns here. He does have the better of the grappling exchanges. I don't know if he submits Camilla Kirk, but I do think he he does win this fight. So I'm going to take Mac Juan Marikani. I'll, I'll say uh, decision win, but it should be a should be an interesting fight. I mean, two guys that their skill sets are like pretty much identical. It's it's going to be pretty fun to see. But I do think Mac Juan is a more skilled fighter out of the two, and by uh, by, by a decent margin. So Mac won by decision. All right, two fades, two fades going up against each other here. I'm, I'm excited to uh, to break it down. We have Tom Breeze going against Antonio Hoyo. Tom Breeze, 29 years old, six foot three, 73 and a half inch reach, 12 and three, two and three in his last five fights. Antonio Hoyo, 31 years old, six foot three, 73 and a half inch reach, nine and four and three and two in his last five fights. Taking a look at the odds, um, we see Tom Breeze. Minus 265, currently minus 235. Antonio Hoyo, plus 205, currently plus 195. So some money's actually coming in on a Hoyo, which is interesting. I've seen a lot of people talking about, you know, parlaying Tom Breeze, which, you know, parlay and Tom Breeze should never, ever be used in the same sentence. But this is a fight where, man, if Tom Breeze does not win this fight, he should, you know, take his gloves off, walk right into the center of, of the octagon, and, uh, and lay him down and, and probably never come back. This is a fight where, man, Tom Breeze should win this fight. He should absolutely win this fight. I mean, on the feet, I, I honestly think it's it's not even close. I think Tom Breeze is a much more skilled fighter. Yes, Ahoyo's, you know, dangerous, but he's only dangerous for so long. The guy has about three minutes of gas, Ahoyo. And then another thing is, you know, Tom Breeze, if he wants to, and this is an interesting aspect of this fight, if he wants to, which he probably should want to, Take this guy down. This guy, Ahoyo, has a 32% takedown defense, cannot stuff a takedown for his life. Tom Breeze does average zero takedowns per 50 minutes. He's never had a takedown in the UFC. I believe he's like 0-6 or 0-7 on takedowns. Hey, if he tries to get him here, he's going to get him, and I do think that should be a path to victory for Tom Breeze, who is a black belt. But I don't know. You can't trust Tom Breeze. You cannot trust this guy, whatever. I think he's extremely skilled. I just think he does make a lot of mistakes in there, and there could be a mistake made here. It's just Antonio Hoyo, if he's going to win, it, it probably has to be in that first round. I mean, the guy's gas tank is it's just so, so bad. And you got to think that Tom Breeze comes in here with a good game plan, and that game plan would be taking down Hoyo. If he wants to strike with him, he can. That's fine. I do think Tom Breeze is a better striker. I think he has a better output as well. But I think the path to least resistance, re resist, can't talk. The path to least resistance is going to be the ground game, and I do think he, he goes there as well, but man, do not, do not parlay Tom Breeze, don't do it, just don't do it, just don't do it, it's, it's hard to trust him, 
This is a, an absolute winnable fight for him. Absolute winnable fight for him. I think he's a much better fighter, and it's really not even close. It's just you cannot trust Tom Breeze these days. So, uh, yeah, give me Tom Breeze. I'm going to say he wins by, I'm going to say like a like a KO. I don't know what round, maybe second or third round. I'm going to say he knocks out Ahoyo. I think this fight to not go the distance could be a decent bet to look at because, man, uh, Tom Breeze, as of late, he has not been seeing the scorecards whatsoever. And then you got a gasser like Ahoyo. I, I think this fight can end inside the distance here. So uh, I'll take Breeze. I'll take him to win by knockout. Yeah, not looking forward to this fight. Two guys that you typically want to look to fade here, going against each other. But I'll take uh, Breeze. All right, Dusko Todorovic going against Gregory Rodriguez. We have Robocop coming in here, making his UFC debut. We have Dusko is 27 years old, six foot one, 74 inch reach, 10 and one, and four and one in his last five fights. Uh, Rodriguez, he is 29 years old, six foot three, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 76 inch reach, nine and three, and four and one in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here, and we have Dusko opening up a big, about 195, 200 favorite, uh, currently minus 150. Robocop opening up plus 160, currently plus 130. So some money's coming in at Robocop, and I definitely agree why here. And I'll get into a little bit of stats. I know we have a lot of fights to talk about, so I'm not going to get too much into the stats here and all that, but. Some things that pop out to me for Dusko, and I know he's only had three fights, but there are some really, really eye-opening stats here. Um, man, the dude has a 45% striking defense. And you take a look at the tape, and you know there are so many red flags for Dusko. I mean, the guy, his striking defense is, is really, really bad. And you know, Robocop's striking defense isn't you know phenomenal, but it's a lot better than Dusko. It's a lot better than Dusko's. And somebody got really mad. Somebody got really offended. Um, by me saying that Dusko's, you know, striking defense is bad, and you know, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, arguable. I mean, it, it's terrible. I mean, forty-six percent striking defense. He fights with his hands down. He fights with his chin up in the air. You know, he backs up. I, I just don't know how anybody could say that his take or his striking defense is good because it, it's just not. And you know, we saw those red flags. We saw the red flags in the Teddy Ash fight where Teddy Ash actually outlanded Dusko one hundred nine to one hundred two. We saw that red flag. We saw. Not many red flags in the Daquan Townsend fight because he took uh, Daquan Townsend down and uh, finished him on the mat. But we saw those, you know, in the past where, you know, he's getting hit. He's fighting with his hands down. And then he finally fights somebody who has some power, has some pop on his punches in uh, Panaheli Soriano, which is a, he's a beast in his own right. And then Soriano absolutely destroyed him. He destroyed him, knocked him down two or three times in that fight and made him pay for his no striking defense. He got clipped. And he got up, and then his striking defense was still terrible, and then he got clipped and then knocked out there. So, um, I mean, unless he's made some serious improvements, I mean, I just I, I gotta go with the other guy here in Robocop. I mean, Robocop, you know, his striking defense isn't isn't the best as well. His, his chin is definitely not the best, but I do think he's a little bit more defensively sound than Dusko. This is a fight that really can go either way. I, I do know one thing: somebody's getting knocked out in this fight. Somebody is 100% getting knocked out in this fight. Um, but I'll take the guy that, you know, hits very hard in Robocop. Robocop hits very, very hard. It may not look like he hits hard at times, but when he touches people, they fall down. And unless Dusko has fixed those, you know, striking defense issues, I think there's a very good chance that Robocop knocks him out here in the first round. So I'm going to take Robocop to win. Give me Rodriguez for the win here. I'm going to say he wins by first round knockout. Would I be shocked if Dusko knocked him out in the first round? No. But I do think somebody's getting knocked out, and somebody's probably getting knocked out in that first round as well. I think it's going to be a war. I think it's going to be fun, but someone's going to sleep here. But I'll take uh, I'll take the underdog here for the win in, in RoboCop. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So many fights. All right. So we have Miguel Baeza going against Santiago Pons and Nibio. We have Baeza who is 20 years old, six foot two, 74 and a half inch reach, 10 and 0, obviously five and 0 in his last five fights. Santiago Ponzinibbio is 34 years old, 73-inch reach. He is, let me bring it up, don't have the height or reach. Yeah, he's 6 foot. He's 6 foot. 6 foot, 27-4, and 4-1 four. Four and in his last five fights. Uh, we'll take a look at the odds here. And we have a close fight of, uh, we have a close fight according to the odds. Baeza opened up minus 160, currently minus 125. Ponzinibbio opened up plus 130, currently plus 105. So, some money's coming in on Ponzinibbio, which is interesting. Um, I do see a lot of people on the Baeza side, and it's just a tough fight to call here. It's a really, really tough fight to call. It's because, you know, the question is, at least for me, and I'm assuming it's a lot of people's questions as well, is, 
you know, is uh, is it the same Ponzinibbio? Is it the same Ponzinibbio we saw against Neil Magny? Is it the same Ponzinibbio we saw against Mike Perry back in 2017? Is it the same Ponzinibbio we saw against Gunnar Nelson in 2017? Is it the same Ponzinibbio? If, if it's the same Ponzinibbio, yeah, he, he wins this fight. He wins this fight easily. He really does. He really does. It's just, you take a look at it. He had that big, he had that big layoff two years, six months ago, and then just fought four months ago. So about a two year in two month layoff, something like that, which, you know, big layoff. He's now 34 years old. And then he came back against, you know, Leach and he just didn't look the same. He did not look the same. He looked, you know, hesitant. You know, the volume was not there. Uh, the Leach outlanded him about two to one in that fight. He just did not look great and ended up getting clipped by, he got clipped by the leech. He got clipped by the leech, which is, you know, definitely not a good look there. So, is it the same Ponzi? You know, did the layoff, I know he had some things going on with the layoff. I know he had to deal with some things, some serious things. Um, Is he the same fighter? Is he not? And I hate to, you know, judge somebody just by their last performance. It could be cage rest. It could be this. It could be that. Um, I hate, you know, writing somebody off after one performance, but I just didn't, really did not like what I saw. And I think, you know, Baeza, he's on his way up. He's 28 years old. You know, he's getting better and better each time we see him. We're seeing these improvements. I guess the only thing I don't like about, you know, Baeza is the level of competition. He's not fought, you know, pretty much anybody. Takashi Sato, Matt Brown, Hector Aldana. He hasn't really fought anybody. So this is going to be the, you know, the the toughest task of his career here. And I don't know, I, I, th- I think he passes it. I think he passes it here, but, man, I don't know. I'm, I'm interested to see what Ponzi shows up. Is it going to be the Ponzi of old, or is it going to be, you know, kind of the Ponzi we saw in the leech fight where he's hesitant, you know, he's not looking great. Maybe the speed's not as, as there as much as, as it had been in the past. And I don't know, I'm going to take Baeza. Baeza, you know, he's a beast. He hits like a truck. I think if he can connect on Ponzi, I think he can go down. Ponzi has been knocked out. I want to say like two or three times. I know he got knocked out by the leech. He has been knocked out, yeah, two times. So I, I think there could be a third here. I'll take Baeza to win by knockout. I'll take him to win by knockout, but uh, I don't know if I want to put my money on this one because of the question marks on the Ponzi and side. But I will take Baeza to win by KO here. All right. Roman Delizzi going against Lariano Staropoli. We have Roman Delizzi, who is 32 years old, 6'2", 76 inch reach, 8 and 1. And four and one in his last five fights. Then we have uh, Star Poli, who is 20 years old, six foot one, 71 and a half inch reach, nine and three and three and two in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. Delizzi open up minus 175, currently minus 140. Star Poli open up plus 145, um, currently plus 120. So some money's coming in on Star Poli. Um, you know, honestly, not sure why. I guess it's more of a fade on Delizzi, which is understandable. People don't like Delizzi. The guy has zero fight IQ. He's extremely talented, and I think stylistically this is a great matchup for him. But he has zero fight IQ, so if I had to guess why some money's coming in on Star Poli, that's probably why. Um, you know, on the feet, you, you probably do favor Star Poli. Um, you know, the more volume, I think he's going to be faster by a mile here. But I think the the physicality and the biggest thing here is going to be the the difference in the size. Lindsay, first of all, is going to have about a five and a half inch reach advantage, a little bit of a height advantage as well. And you have Star, Star Poli, who is coming up a weight class. He's coming up a weight class here. And then we have Delizzi, who, you know, just recently came down from 205. So Delizzi is going to be the much, much bigger fighter. And some stats I do want to point out, because they are somewhat relevant to the fight. Star Poli does have a 57% takedown defense. Um, he was taken down a couple times by Tim Means, which is, you know, not not... Not terrible, but he was taken down by Tim Means. He was controlled a quite a bit in that fight as well. And he was taken down by Muslim Salikov. You know, you know, somebody fighting on this card, Muslim Salikov, the striker, took him down three times. So just not a not a great look at all. Um, but yeah, I mean Delizzi, like I said, he's talented. The fight IQ's not there. If you bet on Delizzi, you're gonna be extremely frustrated um, a bunch of times. But I do think he wins. I do think he gets takedowns. Maybe he submits Staropoli, but would it be shocked if, I don't know, he rolls for a leg or something when he doesn't need to? I remember the one fight with John Alon where he hurt John Alon really bad and he yelled at his corner, Coach, you want me to submit him? You know, during the fight, it's just things like that where I just can't put my money on Delizze. But I do think stylistically this is a phenomenal matchup for him. 
But if you do want to uh, fade Dalidze, if you do think he does, you know, make some mistakes, if you do think he does gas out, which is very likely, <laughs> very likely he does make a mistake here and there, very likely he does gas out. But I do think he does enough to get the win, and I'm going to say he wins by decision. But uh, yeah, I really don't want to put my money on Roman Dalidze. That fight IQ is horrible. Probably one of the worst fight IQs you'll see. But I do think, you know, skill for skill, stylistically, I, I do think this is a good matchup for him. So give me Roman Dalidze for the win. I'll take him to win by decision. All right, we have the co-main event. We have a Walt Harris going against Marcin Tybura. We have Marcin Tybura is 35 years old, 6'3", 78-inch reach, 21-6, and 4-1 in his last five fights. Walt Harris, 37 years old, 6'5", 81-inch reach, 13-9, and nine, and 3-2 and two in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here. We have... Ty Burrow opening up minus 165, currently minus 170. Harris opening up plus 135, currently plus 150. So lines kind of stay the same throughout the week, last week and a half, two weeks. And it's an interesting matchup. I'll go into the stats a little bit for the co-main and main event. It kind of flew by, you know, the other fights on the card. Uh, but, yeah, we'll get into it. So Ty Burrow, as far as a significant strikes landed per minute, 3.7 compared to Walt Harris's 2.95. Harris does have a 38% accuracy, which is not great. Tybura does have a 50%. Uh, as far as the significant trike differential, Tybura has a positive 0.45, and Walt Harris has a negative 0.48, which, you know, never like to see a negative significant trike differential. As far as the grappling stats, and I do think this is an interesting aspect of this fight because Tybura, he probably should be going to those takedowns. He does average about a takedown and a half per 15 minutes, 45% accuracy, very good. Harris does have a 72% takedown defense. And it's a tough fight to call. Like, it really is a, a pretty tough fight to call because you have Walt Harris, who has a ton of power. You know, maybe not the best gas tank. You know, maybe not the best ground game. But he has a ton of power. The dude has a 100% finish rate. He's never won by submission. He's never won by decision. When he's winning, and in, in, in 22 fights, when he's winning, every single one of his wins have came by knockout. And what makes it so hard is, you know, Ty Burra, the dude's chin is not great. It's not great at all. He's been knocked out four times. But I will say this. I think Ty Burr is, you know, the better fighter. I think he's the, you know, the much better fighter. I think he has the much better skill set. I think he's more well-rounded by a decent amount. I think stylistically, he has, it's a good matchup for him. He get this fight down to the mat. Um, you know, don't, don't get knocked down in the first round. Extend the fight. Extend the fight. Get Walt Harris tired. Take him down. And I think, uh, you know, a late finish is very, very likely for Ty Burr. It's just... He needs to survive that early, early storm of Walt Harris. So if you like Walt Harris, you bet the first round knockout, maybe the second round knockout. But other than that, I don't see Walt Harris winning decision. I don't see Walt Harris winning later in the fight as well. And I don't know. I think Ty Burra just has more ways to win. I think higher output on the feet. Probably the better striker, honestly. It's just Walt Harris has that power. And then the better ground game by a mile. I believe Ty Burra is like a black belt, which he has no... Submissions in the UFC or nothing like that, but maybe he could, you know, get a late submission here against Walt Harris. But I'm going to take the the fighter I think has more past the victory, which is going to be Marcin Tybura. Do I love the line? No, I do not, because I am fully aware that Walt Harris can clip him in the first round, and would I be surprised if that happened? No, I would not. But I think Tybura has more past the victory, and I do think he is the better fighter, so I will go with him. But a fight you probably don't want to put your money on overall. But I'll take Tybura to win. I'm going to say third round. I'm going to say third round finish. It could be a sub, could be a TKO. I'll go with um, I'll go with TKO here. I'll go third round TKO for Marcin Tybura. All right, now we have the main event. Before we get into it, if you guys can like the video, that would be much much appreciated. Let's try to get uh, let's get let's get 400 likes on this video. 14 fights, 400 likes, big card. Let's do it. Um, and then also Friday live stream, seven o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Saturday live stream, one hour prior to the fights. And I'm going to start getting out more content. I want to get out like a content schedule in the near future. Um, you know, add more content to the channel. I have lots of ideas going on. So uh, make sure you subscribe so you not miss out on the new content coming you guys' way. And as always, really do appreciate the support. But we'll get into the main event here. So we have Jarzina Rosenstruck going against Augustus Sakai. We have Rosenstruck, who's 33 years old, 6'4", 78 inch reach, 11 and 2, and 3 and 2 in his last five fights. Augustus Sakai is 30 years old, 6'3", 77 inch reach, 15 and 2 and 1. And four and one in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds here, and we have Rosenstruck opening up a minus 145, currently minus 130. Sakai opening up plus 115, currently plus 110. And I'll be honest, like I think this line should be flipped. I know a lot of people are on Rosenstruck, which is you know very 
I don't know. It's it's weird because you take a look at and I'll get into all the stats and all that, and you watch the tape, and it's like, man, this is a. Uh, I, I think Sakai should be favored here, but we'll get into the stats and all that. Sakai, he does land 5.32 significant strikes per minute, 48% accuracy. Rosenstruck does land 3.14, 48% accuracy. So very, very low volume on the Rosenstruck side. And Sakai's not someone that's going to throw you know a ton of volume, but you know a lot more than Rosenstruck. And I do think that's very important here. Rosenstruck does absorb 3.48 with a 39% striking defense. I will repeat that again: a 39% strikeout de- striking defense. And shout out to Uncle Weezy with the database. He, he pointed out that you know out of everyone in the heavyweight division. Jarzina Rosenstruck has the worst striking defense out of any fighter in the heavyweight division, which really makes you think. And he does have a negative significant strike differential of minus 0.34, okay? So, like I said, we don't like seeing that negative significant strike differential. And then you have Sakai, who does have a positive significant strike differential of 1.3, which is very good, 50% striking defense, which is not great, but it is better than that, 39% of Rosenstruck there. As far as the grappling stats go, we don't have to talk about it much. I do think this primarily stays on the feet. If there is a takedown, it's going to be coming from Sakai, which he only has about a takedown in the UFC. I think it'd be smart for him to get takedowns here. I just don't know if he'll do that. So I do expect, you know, for the most part, maybe Sakai gets a takedown here and there. For the most part, it's going to play out on the feet. And for me, like, I think Rosenstruck's knockout or bust. I'll say it. I, I think he's knockout or bust. I just don't see him out voluming Sakai. Rosenstruck, you know, he's very, very hesitant. He looks for that one that one bomb, and he doesn't throw much. He does not throw much. We saw it in, you know, pretty much, you know, a lot of his fights. If he's not getting that first round knockout, you can really see how low volume that guy is. But the one thing he has is that power. It's that power, and that's probably why he is the favorite. Um, which I, I I completely disagree with him being the favorite, but that's probably why he's the favorite because of that power. It's just Sakai. Like he's a very good chin. Sakai's only been knocked out once, and it was by Overeem. And that was a fight where he, you know, gassed out to the max. Overeem was taking him down, ground and pound, all that good stuff. And I just don't, see, you know, see Rosenstruck doing that. I don't see Rosenstruck making Sakai work like that. I don't see Rosenstruck taking him down. So I think it's going to be, you know, played on the feet. I think Sakai is going to, you know, just clearly, you know, just just do more. I think he's going to do more throughout five rounds or until there's maybe a, a late finish on the Sakai side. But you know, could Rosenstruck knock him out? Yeah, he could. Rosenstruck does hit like an absolute truck. He, you know, he knocked out. Um, Junior Dos Santos, which, you know, okay, he knocked out Overeem in the last second of that fight, a very controversial uh, fight as well. I believe I had a, a bet on Rosenstruck as well, which I was happy about it, but, yeah, it was definitely con- controversial there. He knocked out Andre Olovsky, somebody that's been knocked out 11 times. He knocked out Alan Crowder, somebody that should not be in the UFC, and he knocked out Albini, somebody that is not in the UFC. Uh, Crowder's probably not in the, UFC, in the UFC as well. But, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I just think Sakai has a much better chin than all those guys that he knocked out. A much, much better chin. Sakai has a absolute chin on him, and I, I just find it hard to, you know, see Rosenstruck knocking him out early. But it could happen. It's heavyweight. Anything can happen. But I think, you know, the better fighter is going to be Sakai. Rosenstruck, yeah, he has more power, but should he be should he be minus 130 because he's he could knock he could potentially knock him out? I just don't get that. Like this, if anything, it should be a pick him. Probably Sakai favorite because he has more ways to win. Well, Sakai can, you know, implement, you know, the takedown. Sakai could out volume him. Sakai can get a knockout himself. I just don't. Rosenstruck's probably knockout or bust for me. So if you like Rosenstruck, probably bet the knockout. But uh, I do like Sakai. Um, not sure if I'm going to pull the trigger on Sakai, but man, it's tempting. It's very, very tempting. I'm going to keep waiting. Looks like more money is coming in on Jarzino, and, and people are very confident. I've seen people talking about, you know, parlaying Jarzino Rosenstruck, which is interesting. But uh, I'm going to go with Sakai. I think uh, Sakai does get it done. I'm going to say by, I'm actually going to say by like probably like a fifth round knockout. A decision I think is on the table as well. But I'll say fifth round knockout by Sakai. So yeah, exciting, exciting. Glad to be back. Glad to be back uh, breaking down some fights. I hate weeks off. I mean, they're nice. They're nice. They're nice to refresh a little bit. But I hate weeks off. They're, you know, boring Saturdays and all that good stuff. I like talking with you guys and all that. Um, but yeah. Like I said earlier, if you do want to check out the Patreon, you get that $10 betting tier. It really does help me out quite a bit. It lets me do new things for the channel. Um, we get the UFC statistical model, which I did show you guys earlier. First notice on all the bets, I do have five already. Betting article, betting breakdown video, Hail Mary Parlay, access to Discord, and a ton of other content. Um, check it out. It really does help me out. I have just about 300 members on there. 
And uh, yeah, lots of good stuff over there. If you guys can please leave a like on the video, that'd be much, much appreciated. As I always say, one small like really does go a long way. Let's try to hit 400 this week. Big goal. Let's hit 400, 14 fights, big card. And then also subscribe so you do not miss out on my other content. Lots of new content hopefully coming in the very, very near future. I'm definitely working on some things. But um, yeah, lots of stuff coming your guys' way. So thank you for all for all your support as always. And good luck on UFC Vegas 28. Let's make some money. Had a very good week two weeks ago. Um, hopefully continue the success going into this card here. So that's about it, guys. And good luck.